It was August 5th, 1963, when the emergency broadcast system was first introduced. The goal of this system was to create a simple way for government officials to quickly alert the public to the national emergencies which threaten the safety of American citizens. Then from 1963 until 1997, every American television network and every American radio station was required to test that signal. And they did this by interrupting the scheduled program with one of the most annoying tones that you've ever heard. I'm going to do my best to replicate that tone right now, so get ready. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. But it was a horrible sound, and it quickly got your attention, letting you know that something wrong is happening. And, and you know, each network was actually only required to test the system once a week. And yet, once a week, it always seemed to happen Saturday morning, just as Shaggy and Scooby were about to solve the case. And so of all the, the, the Shaggy and Scooby cartoons that I've ever seen, I've never seen one of those cases being concluded. And so I'm very disappointed to learn that it was Mr. Smithers. Never mind. Here in the 21st century, we no longer have the emergency broadcast system, and yet uh, we have so many different ways of receiving emergency alerts. For example, we receive emergency alerts through emails, uh, through texts, and also if you sign up for it, you can receive a, an emergency reverse 911 call, which the government will call your phone and, and give you the information that you want. And while it's true that emergency alerts have never been so readily accessible, it's also true that emergency alerts have never before been so ignored by so many people. If you're like me, then the first thing that you do after purchasing a new cell phone is turn off the emergency alerts feature. I just quickly turn that thing off because I can't stand being interrupted by those annoying alerts. Uh, someone call me if you need to, or, 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 or I'll see it online. Or, or I just don't want my phone buzzing every single time something goes wrong here in America. I don't like it. I don't want the interruption. And it's sad to say, though, that this apathy, which can even be seen in my life, uh, this apathy towards emergency alerts, that actually results in a loss of life. But what's even worse is it's this same sort of carelessness that is actually causing people to end up in hell. And you might be thinking, whoa, that's way too extreme. You know, ignoring emergency alerts is causing people to go to hell. Well, let me explain what I mean. It'll help you to understand that the Lord is also sending out emergency alerts. The Lord Jesus is sending out a spiritual emergency alert, which we call the gospel message. And you know, while it's true that the gospel message is the good news which presents us with the plan of salvation that we can be saved by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, it's also true that this message is actually an emergency alert. The gospel message is an emergency alert which helps people to understand that there is something to be saved from. When we talk about the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to understand that there is something that we are being saved from. And most certainly, we're being saved from impending disaster. Please understand that those who will not receive the truth of the gospel message are facing the righteous wrath of God, which will be poured out upon every unbeliever for the rest of eternity in the lake of fire. And so while we can rejoice in the fact that the gospel message has gone out into the world so that unbelievers might become believers, it's sad to say that there are many who are quick to ignore the Lord's spiritual emergency alert. This morning we're going to consider that the emergency alert that the Lord has issued so that every person might escape the everlasting fires of hell. And as we make our way through our text today, we're going to learn that, first of all, the Lord has issued an emergency alert to those who hear. Secondly, we'll see that the Lord has issued an emergency alert to those who thirst. Thirdly, and finally, we'll see that the Lord has issued an emergency alert to those who desire. 
Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 22, because here we find the Apostle John. He's presenting a final invitation to receive the grace of God. And as you make your way to Revelation 22, I should continue to set the stage for our text today by taking a moment to remind you about the disasters which will occur during the time that we call the tribulation. Throughout our study of this book, we've learned all about the wars which will come along in that time period. We've learned about the famines and the pestilence which will plague this planet during the tribulation. And not only that, but we've also learned about the massive meteorites which will impact the earth and the hordes of demons which will torment those who are here. And then the day will come when every unrepentant unbeliever will stand before the judgment throne of God and, and, and those who refuse to re receive the grace of God, they will be cast into the lake of fire forevermore. Without debate, disaster is coming. And while we've seen many natural disasters recently, things are only going to get worse. And with that being the case, we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord has issued an emergency alert to save those who will hear. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me there at Revelation chapter 22, I want to focus our attention on verse 17. Here John tells us that the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Now here in our text today, we find the spirit of God. He's wrapping up this book by encouraging every person to escape the coming catastrophe. And I love that this is found here in the end of the book of Revelation as well as the, the end of the Bible. It's like the Lord is wrapping up the scriptures with a final invitation, a final word of warning to come. In order to further grasp this invitation, it'll help you to understand that the Greek word, which here is translated come, it's based on a command which calls a person to leave one place and head to another. The Holy Spirit and the bride are saying, hey, come, leave this place where you are now and come to this place that's better. It's kind of like a reverse 911 call. Uh, those reverse 911 calls are designed to let you know, hey, disaster is coming to where you are right now. You need to come somewhere else that's safe kind of what's happening here is God is sending this reverse 911 call to us to, to say, hey, you know, where you are right now, unbeliever, is a bad place. You don't want to be there. Come to this place that's better. The spirit of the Lord is encouraging every person then to leave the broad path that leads to destruction so that we can follow our savior on the narrow path, which leads to everlasting life. We should also notice again there in the beginning of verse 17 that it's the spirit and the bride who are calling people to come. Now, this is an extremely important point to make, and one reason why is based on the fact that the unrepentant unbeliever will never initiate their repentance and faith towards God. Please understand that. The unrepentant unbeliever will never initiate their repentance. This was precisely the point that Paul was making in Romans chapter 3. There he assures his audience that there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. There is not one sinner who will ever choose in and of themselves to begin the search for a relationship with God. Because we have all turned aside. The unbeliever has turned away from God, not towards him. The carnal mind left to itself will never choose to pursue the grace of God. Not only that, but the Lord Jesus also revealed that no one can come to him unless the Father draws them. Now wrap your mind around that one for a moment. No one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them to Jesus. What this means then is that God must graciously initiate our salvation by drawing him drawing us to himself, I should say. With that being the case, we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord has promised to draw all men to himself. We can rejoice in knowing that the Lord has promised to send a heavenly helper. And I'm speaking of the Holy Spirit who was sent to draw all men to repentance by convicting the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. In this way, the Holy Spirit was sent to 
instigate. He was sent to initiate the salvation of sinners, knowing that we would never initiate our own salvation. The Holy Spirit was sent to initiate our salvation by showing up and helping us to understand our great need for salvation. That's what the conviction of sin helps us to understand. He was sent to convict us of sin because we've sinned, uh, of righteousness because we're unrighteous and, and God is righteous, and of judgment because those who will not repent will be judged. The Holy Spirit was sent to draw us to Jesus Christ because apart from that drawing, we would never choose Jesus on our own. But now this raises a very important question and the question is simply this. Does the Holy Spirit draw every single person through the conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment or, or is he only convicting the hearts of those whom he has already decided to grant the gift of grace? Now you might think well, this is a ridiculous question. Of course he's drawing every person. And yet I would point out that there are many Christians, very, very sincere saints who would have us to believe that the Spirit of God is only calling a few a pre-selected, predetermined group of people. The, uh, they believe that the Lord is only uh, reaching out to those who should receive the gracious gift of regeneration by his predetermined choice. In light of their beliefs, we should ask, is the Holy Spirit inviting every sinner to come or is he only drawing the selected elect? Well, with this question in mind, we should notice again here that the Spirit of the Lord was extending this invitation to those who hear. That word hear was translated from a Greek word which refers to those who receive the instructions of a teacher. So we're not just talking about the faculty of hearing because certainly deaf people can come to the Lord. He's talking about those who seek out and receive the instructions of a teacher. So it's not just about audible hearing but rather it's about the, the, the search for understanding. It's like if I say, do you hear me right now? I'm not saying, can you hear my voice? But can you hear what I'm saying to you? Do you understand what I'm saying? Those who hear are those who seek to understand uh, the sense of what's being taught. Sadly, though, there are many who, while having ears to hear, they don't hear. Many who have ears to hear, and yet they choose to ignore the emergency alert of the Lord. But this is our focus. If you would hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to Matthew chapter 13 because it's in the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel account where we find the Lord Jesus. He's presenting the people with a parable. This parable is about a farmer who went out to sow seeds into the soil of his fields. And then after describing the way in which this seed ended up falling upon four different types of soil, he concluded this parable by declaring he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Or in other words, uh, this farmer was clearly planting corn in the fields because he who has ears to hear. Okay. That's just the corniest joke ever. But the Lord here is encouraging his audience to seek out the spiritual meaning of this parable by saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let, let, let him come and get more understanding about this. And with that being the case, the disciples wanted to know why he spoke to the people in parables. They wanted to know, what, well, if, if you're wanting people to understand what you're saying, then, 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 then why speak in this way that can you know, be easily misunderstood? And there in Matthew 13, beginning in the middle of verse 10, we find the disciples asking him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, 
and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Based on these verses, we can see the reason for why Jesus spoke to the people in parables. Jesus spoke to the people in parables because he was separating those who wanted to hear from those who had no desire to comprehend what he was saying. His parables were designed to separate people into two groups, those who wanted to stick around and learn more from those who, they weren't really there to hear him anyway. Now, it's true that the parables of the Lord Jesus were at times difficult to understand, but it's also true that he was always happy to reveal the deeper meaning to those who stuck around and sought the deeper meaning. As a matter of fact, here in Matthew chapter 13, we find the Lord Jesus explaining the parable of the sower and the seed. As a matter of fact, uh, look with me here at Matthew 13, verse 18. Here Jesus goes on to declare, therefore, hear. And he's not talking about, you know, you know, can you hear what I'm saying, but can you understand what I'm saying? He's saying, understand the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's helping his audience to comprehend the parable that he had previously presented about the sower and the seed. And according to this parable, a person must first have a heart that is ready to receive the word of God. Uh, We have to have a heart that's ready and open to receive the seed of God's word. And the person who opens their heart to the word of God and seeks further understanding, well, they're going to be open to now hear the voice of the Lord. And then when the unbeliever opens their ears to hear the voice of the Lord, well, then they're able to hear the calling of Christ. And it's at that point in time when the sinner is able to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, the average unbeliever, well, they've tended to harden their hearts against the voice of the Lord. And as they harden their hearts against the voice of the Lord, they choke out the seed of the word that they've heard. Therefore, they continue to reject the conviction that's brought by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come to them to convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment, but they shut their heart, harden their heart to the word. Well, thankfully for them, the Lord has implemented a two-pronged plan for reaching those who are currently rejecting his gift of grace. And in order to prove my point, let's look again back at Revelation chapter 22. I want to focus your attention once again on verse 17. Here again, John tells us that the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who who hears say, come. Now, based on this, we can see that the Lord not only sent his Holy Spirit to draw us and call us and call us to come, but, but he's also given his bride the same exact task. It's important for us to remember right now that the bride of Christ, this is another name for the Christian church. Therefore, when John tells us that the spirit and the bride say come, he's helping us to understand that the Lord has actually commissioned every Christian to go out and share the good news of grace with every person who's willing to hear us. Any person that's willing to listen, we should be going to them and saying, hey, come. This was precisely the point that John was making when he declared, let him who hears 
say, come. Let him who hears, if you've heard the calling of Christ, you've opened your heart to the gospel message, you've become born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have been commissioned to say, come. You have been commissioned, even commanded, to go into the world to cry out to those who will hear, come. Leave the place, leave the broad road that you're traveling right now and come and join me in following Jesus on the narrow path that leads to everlasting life. This is our task. The spirit and the bride say, come. This is the commission that the Lord Jesus presented right before his ascension into heaven when he directed his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord has called every Christian to to go out and lead others into the grace of God by teaching them to observe all the things that Christ has commanded us. Everything that Jesus taught, the, the bride of Christ has been told to go and teach it, to go and preach it. In this way, we sort of become like the good neighbor who, after having received an emergency alert, then attempts to go and warn all of the neighbors about the imminent disaster. Why wouldn't you? If you've heard the emergency alert and you've believed it, why wouldn't you want to turn around and warn everybody else about the impending disaster that's coming? If you've heard the Spirit say, come, and you've received the gospel of grace, if you've been born again, born of the Spirit, then it's your job now to go out and say, come, to anyone who will hear. Based on all of this, then we see that the Lord has issued an emergency alert by sending the Spirit and the bride to those who will hear his voice. But not only those who hear his voice, because remember, uh, there are some who have ears to hear, but they're not listening. They're not hearing in in the sense that they want to understand it. Well, thankfully for them, the Lord isn't just calling those who hear, but he's also calling those who thirst. And with this as our focus, let's look again at Revelation 22, verse 17. Here the apostle John tells us that the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come and let him who thirsts come. Now, Here in the middle of this verse, we find John assuring his audience that the Lord is not only attempting to warn those who will hear his voice, but he's also attempting to reach those who are filled with thirst. And for the sake of clarity, the Greek word translated thirst, it not only refers to those who are parched and and, and dehydrated and, and thirsty in that physical sense, but it's also a word which was used figuratively. It's a word that was used of those who have a strong craving for something, like, like right now I'm thirsty for chocolate cake. This is the same sort of thirst that, you know, that Mick Jagger was singing about when he declared, I can't get no satisfaction, right? He's saying, I'm craving something and I can't get satisfaction. There's nothing that ever quenches that thirst. Truth be told, we all struggle with carnal cravings. We all struggle with those those cravings which produce within us this soulish thirst which can't ever seem to be quenched. It's for this reason that we're so prone to pursuing those pleasures which we think are going to satisfy, and yet the more we consume, the more we crave. For example, those who are craving an escape from reality, they oftentimes turn to alcohol and drugs to to try to quench that thirst. Or those who crave sexual pleasure, but but they want it apart from the relational difficulties of marital conflict. They they want the sexual pleasure, but they just don't want the the, the tough times that come with marital commitments. Well, they oftentimes turn to the secret sin of pornography. Because that's just easier than trying to make a relationship work. So they turn to the secret sin of pornography, thinking that'll satisfy what they're thirsty for. But this too is a carnal craving, which becomes an insatiable thirst and it can never be quenched. The more you consume, the more you crave. Not only that, but, but I would point out that there are many things that we thirst after, which, which really aren't always addictions that we would associate with sin. 
drugs, alcohol, you, you know, uh, pornography. These are things that we quickly recognize as, okay, that's, that's a sinful path right there. But, but there are things that we become addicted to, things that we crave, things that we're thirsty for that we wouldn't think there's really anything wrong with it in and of itself. For example, uh, there are some people uh, who are craving to be thin. They're addicted uh, to dieting. And, and we wouldn't, you know, quickly think that that's a problem. You know, the, there's nothing wrong with an addiction to being thin. Of course, the Bible says that he who put, places his faith in the Lord shall be made fat. You know, and, and so we can see who the true people of faith here are today. But there are people struggling with anorexia. It's not a struggle I've ever had, personally. But there are people who, who literally, they look in the mirror, and no matter how thin they are, they think they're fat. And, and it's sad. It, it, it really is. It's an addiction to dieting and an, and an addiction to, to thinking you're not thin enough. You know, this is a craving, which is an unquenchable thirst. And then there's the gym rats who are addicted to exercise, right? If you go to a gym, then you know who they are. If you go to the gym enough, then you are that gym rat. <laughs> they might be thirsting, you know, for, you know, bigger muscles, or, or they might be thirsting for the release of dopamine that happens when you work out. This, this is a, a release of a chemical that happens in the re reward center of the brain, and, and people can become addicted to it, which is why they got to go exercise, got to go exercise, Right? They crave that dopamine. Some people become shopaholics, and the reason why is due to the fact that they feel this sense of reward and accomplishment whenever they find a bargain or a really good deal. And it reminds me, I, I, I was at a Walgreens here recently, and I saw two gals with a fist full of coupons. And they're just scrolling through these coupons and looking for the deals, and they're, they're just throwing all of this one product that was like maybe some buy one, get 20 free or something. I don't know. All I know is they've got their cart just filled with this one product and they're just like, you can just see their eyes are just lit up like this is just the best thing ever. And I'm just thinking, what are you gonna do? You're gonna store this all in your garage? I mean, it's like, I'm gonna see these gals on the next episode of Hoarders. But in their mind, they're just excited as can be and they're running through Walgreens like a rat in a maze, you know, looking for the pellet, 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 you know. They're just so excited about it because they're addicted to the deal. They're craving the bargain. And so they become shopaholics. Now, dieting, shopping, exercising, these aren't things that we would call sin. And yet they become these unquenchable thirsts that take over our lives if we allow them. As we consider all of these different cravings which cause us to, to suffer from this constant thirst, it's important to understand there's only one way to completely quench our thirst, and I'm not talking about Sprite. But this is our focus. If you would hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to John chapter 4. You see, it's in the fourth chapter of John's gospel account where we find the Lord Jesus. He's reaching out to a Samaritan woman who had gone out to Jacob's well because she needed to collect some necessary water. So she's there drawing water at Jacob's well, and it was there where the Lord Jesus showed up. And, and knowing her greatest needs, he began to minister to her. He, he began to try to help her to understand that he alone was able to quench the thirst that was in her soul. With this in mind, look with me there at John 4. I want to begin reading at verse 13. Here we learn that Jesus said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Now, here we see that this woman is a little confused about what Jesus is saying because she's instantly thinking that, oh, if, if, if I had this water that I would never thirst again, then I wouldn't have to come back here to draw this water out of this well. But he's not talking about the water in the well. Of course, she would need to go ahead and, and get more water in the future, right? He's not talking about her physical thirst. He's talking about that soulish thirst. He's talking about the cravings that she had within her heart 
And he's helping her to understand that he alone can quench that thirst. And in order to help her to understand what he was talking about, he goes on to ask her to do something for him. Look with me there at verse 16. Here Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said. I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband in that you spoke truly. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus, he's actually exposing the real thirst found in this woman's heart. Here's a woman who was thirsty for male companionship. It was her greatest thirst. It was her greatest need or or self-perceived need. And clearly she wasn't very good at relationships because she has had five failed marriages. And rather than risking a sixth divorce, she simply decided to engage in the sinful practice of premarital cohabitation. Rather than suffering through a sixth divorce because she knew it would happen, she just decided, well, I'm just going to live with guys so that I can quench this thirst. Now, to those who have been through five divorces, I would just say, stop, (laughs) just stop. There's a craving there that only Jesus can satisfy. It's a misdirected craving, but that's true of all of us. Whatever cravings we have, Whatever we just continue to, to pursue and go after and crave. And listen, Jesus is the one who can quench the thirst. The carnal cravings that, that we have, Jesus alone can quench. We all struggle with carnal cravings, which uh, tend to lead us into a life of sin. And, and while it's true that every person on the planet struggles with similar sorts of thirst, it's, it's also true that the Lord Jesus is the one who promises to quench the thirst of those who trust in him. And this was precisely the point that the Lord Jesus was making there in John chapter 4, verse 14, where he declares, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. If you're thirsty for something today, I'm here to tell you that the Lord Jesus can quench that thirst because the water that he gives us becomes in us a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life so that rather than quenching things that are beyond us, he satisfies us from within so that we actually become a well of water ourselves to the people around us. And I should point out that this is an open invitation to everyone who thirsts. Notice again there in in verse 14, whoever drinks of the water, that word whoever, it refers to anyone and everyone. Simply put, the Lord Jesus was presenting an open invitation to every single person who thirsts. And, and, And who is that? Everyone. Who has cravings? Who has thirsts? Everyone. In order to more fully grasp this open invitation, can you continue holding your place there in the book of Revelation? And let's turn forward three chapters to John chapter 7. You see, it's in the seventh chapter of John's gospel account where we find the Lord Jesus in a very similar way, extending the same invitation to anyone and to everyone who thirsts. As a matter of fact, look with me there at John chapter 7, beginning at verse 37. Here, John tells us that it was the last day, the great day of the feast, when Jesus stood and cried out, and here's what he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, As the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's presenting an open invitation and it's an invitation to anyone. And that word, that Greek word, anyone, it literally speaks of anyone. It's whosoever will. It's also important to understand that the Greek word translated anyone, it's an indefinite pronoun. If he was speaking about a specific group of people, he wouldn't have used this word because this word is an indefinite or undefined group of people. 
Anyone literally means everyone has been invited to receive the thirst quenching living water, which is received by faith whenever we believe in Jesus Christ. Sadly, every unbeliever on the planet today is choosing, choosing to suffer from spiritual dehydration. It's their choice to. Because Jesus is saying, anyone that's thirsty, I'll give you something to drink. So they're choosing spiritual dehydration. They're, they're choosing to, to dry up in the desert, so to speak. And knowing that the unbelievers around us who are attempting to quench their spiritual thirst with, 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 with all these different waters that are found in poisoned wells, well, we would do well to recognize that what they need is direction to the well of living water. People are running off to, to happy hour to get well drinks because they think that's going to satisfy them. They call it happy hour while they go drink d- depressants. Makes absolutely no sense. We know where the well of living water is. We know where they can quench their thirst. We would do well to help them. We would do well to invite them as the bride of Christ. Come, if you're thirsty, we know the one who can quench the thirst. Otherwise, they're just going to continue to drown in the spiritual cesspool of their own carnal cravings. And this brings us to our third point, because listen, the Lord has issued an emergency alert to those who hear his voice, and and not only that, but to also those who have a spiritual thirst, which is anyone and everyone. But finally, we should consider how the Lord has issued this emergency alert to those who desire. And with this as our focus, let's make our way back to Revelation 22. I want to focus your attention once more on verse 17. Here again, John writes, the spirit and the bride say, come and let him who hears say, come and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Here we see that the Lord Jesus is not just calling those who hear. He's not just calling those who thirst, but also those who have a determined desire uh, to follow after whatever they desire. He's speaking of those who have determined to follow their own will. In order to grasp how I arrive at this interpretation, it'll help you to understand that the Greek word, which here is translated desire, it refers to the resolve that stems from our determined will. Not only that, but it also refers to the intentions of the individual. When someone intends to do whatever they have determined, this is their desire. You see the desires of people in whatever they they do because we tend to do what we desire to do. In light of this, it's important to understand that the unbeliever and God find themselves locked in a war of wills. That's what's happening in the life of the unbeliever. They are locked in a war of wills. And with this as our focus, hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. And as you make your way to the 23rd chapter of Matthew's gospel account, I want to take a moment to point out that the unrepentant unbeliever, as I've already pointed out, is unable to initiate a relationship with God. They're never going to choose to uh, pursue God in and of themselves. They, They don't have a determined will to go and find salvation. But instead, the unregenerate sinner is hell-bent on living their life according to their own desires. And it's for this reason that the average unbeliever will quickly recoil and reject the emergency alert uh, alert of the gospel message, kind of like whenever that emergency broadcast network noise would come on the television, what would you do? You want to turn the channel and (laughs) you were trapped because it was on every channel. And so you just turned off the television for a moment so you didn't have to listen to it. And that's what unbelievers tend to do. You show up and you try to present them with the good news of the gospel message. You act as the bride and say, come. And they go, la, 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 I'm not listening. They don't want to hear it. 
For example, this is the sort of group of people that Jesus was talking to here in Matthew chapter 23. If you would look with me at verse 37 here, Jesus declares, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as hens uh, gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus is saying, it's my desire that you be saved, but you are not willing. That word translated willing at the end of verse 37, it's the same Greek word that John used back in Revelation 22, which is translated desire. Here we see that the, the, the concept of being willing or not willing is, is, has, has everything to do with our desires. This is also the same Greek word that Peter used in 2 Peter 3, where he described uh, unbelieving scoffers as those who willfully forget what God has done. So we see that the unbeliever has a will which is in conflict with God's will. As a matter of fact, I'll remind you, this is the same word that Paul uses in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, where he tells us that God, our Savior, desires. That's the word will. Same word that, that, that I've been talking about. God, our Savior, desires or has a determined will for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's will. His desires for all men to be saved. And, and, and Peter even confirms this in the third chapter of his second epistle where he assures his audience that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has a will. He has a d determined will to save all sinners. But he won't force us. He won't force the unbeliever to receive that free gift of grace, but rather he leads us by his grace. He leads us by his loving kindness so that we might come to a place of receiving that free gift by faith. In light of this, it's important to understand that the unbeliever, every unbeliever, every unbeliever on the planet today is engaging in a war of wills against God. God wills that they should be saved, but has allowed them to make up their own minds. God has sent the Holy Spirit to draw them, but allows them the final say. Well, that is until judgment day. And on judgment day, the Lord must cast every unrepentant unbeliever into the lake of fire. You see, God's will is ultimately going to be fulfilled. He is the sovereign ruler of heaven and earth. And while he desires the salvation of every sinner, he won't force you to be saved. But at the end of the day, he will cast you into hell if you reject salvation. He's given us the freedom to accept or reject his free gift of grace. But those who are unwilling to submit to our Savior Jesus are simultaneously choosing to accept the righteous wrath of God. Now, I realize that there are those who will insist that God would be unjust to punish those who've never received the emergency alert. And I would agree. I, I, I would agree with that person. The person who comes along and says, well, God would be unfair. What about the, 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 the person on the deserted island who, who never heard the gospel message? They never received the emergency alert. And, and God would be unfair to put them in hell because they never had a chance. And, and I say, I agree. That would be completely unjust, completely unfair for God to do that. But is that what God does? Is that the way it goes down, that there's people on this planet that are somehow unreachable to an infinite God? With this question in mind, continue holding your place there in the book of Revelation. I'd like you to turn with me now to Romans chapter 1. You see, it's in Romans 1 where we find Paul. He's writing this letter to the church in Rome, and we find Paul addressing this very issue. And according to Paul here in Romans chapter 1, Every person has been given the same opportunity to respond to the Lord's spiritual emergency alert. As a matter of fact, look with me there at Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. Here, Paul declares, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. 
For in it, that's the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now notice in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Here in these verses, we find Paul helping us to understand that every unbeliever, whether they're Jew or whether they're a Gentile, which is every single person on the planet, you're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. And so every unbeliever, whether Jew or Gentile, is actually suppressing the truth of God with their own unrighteous desires. And how do I know that? Because they're unbelievers. You see, the unrepentant unbeliever isn't an unbeliever because they can't hear the emergency alert. They're not an unbeliever because uh, they, they haven't been given the opportunity to, uh, uh, to know the information. No, instead, the unrepentant unbeliever is an unbeliever because they are choosing to suppress the truth of God in their unrighteousness. They're taking what they know within their heart and they're simply rejecting it. Much like the person who gets a new cell phone and turns the emergency alerts off immediately, that's what they're doing with the emergency alert of God. They're just turning it off. I don't want to hear it. In order to prove my point, I'll remind you the Holy Spirit was sent to convict not just some people, but the entire world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit's out in the world everywhere. And listen, the Holy Spirit is infinite. He's boundless. It's not like, you know, the Holy Spirit gets to that deserted island and says, oh, I couldn't reach that person. How could I ever get to that deserted island? The Holy Spirit gets to a Muslim country. Oh, they don't want the Holy Spirit in the Muslim country, so yeah, he can't. No, the Holy Spirit is infinite. He's boundless. He's able to convict the entire world of sin and righteousness and judgment. There is not one person, not even the deserted island person, not one person that the Holy Spirit cannot reach. Not only that, but listen, we're not born blank slates. There's innate information in every single person, which includes the logic that God has given to mankind to use so that we can think properly, and the law of God, which helps us to understand the righteous standard of God, which is why people feel guilty when they do something that's wrong, whether they've read the Bible or not. And so we have logic, which God has given to us, and we have the law written upon our hearts, and the law, according to Paul, is the tutor, the teacher, which brings us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. Isaiah himself says, come now, let's reason together. Use the logic that God has given you to examine the conviction that you have in your heart because the law is there convicting you of you doing things that are wrong. You put those two things together, and though your sins are like scarlet, and though you've been stained... With, with the unrighteousness of your sinful decisions, he says, you shall be made white as snow. A proper use of logic as you reflect on the law that's written in your heart should lead you to a place where you become a believer in the one who can save us. Everyone has the same opportunity. Everyone is receiving the same emergency alert. Therefore, the unbeliever is not an unbeliever because they haven't been, you know, given the opportunity to become a believer. The unbeliever isn't an unbeliever because they can't hear the emergency alert, but because simply they've turned it off. They're not listening. And listen, the Lord not only sent out his Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, but he's also called his bride, which is the church to go out and sound the alarm, to rebroadcast the gospel message so that some might hear and believe and be saved. This was precisely the point that John is making here in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Again, he declares the spirit and the bride, the spirit and the church say, come. That's evangelism. The spirit and the church say, come. Let him who hears 
Say, come, let him who thirsts, come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. It is a free gift. And I'm here to tell you, church, the Holy Spirit wants to help us. The Holy, the Holy Spirit wants to empower us to go out and sound this alarm. The Holy Spirit is, is indwelling the church, the bride, to go out and preach the gospel message so that some might believe and be saved. So then the final point of application for every Christian here this morning is this. Are you accomplishing your calling? Are you accomplishing your commission? Are you rebroadcasting the spiritual emergency alert of the Lord so that the unbelievers around you might hear the gospel of grace by which sinners can be saved? Are you presenting the people around you with the promise that the Lord Jesus alone can quench their spiritual thirst? Are you sounding the alarm by helping them to understand that the Lord desires to save every sinner? Are you helping them to understand that this salvation is only received by those who will submit their will to his? Are you acting like the bride? by inviting people to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, as a pastor, I've had the pleasure of officiating many weddings. I've had the privilege of spending time preparing with groom and with bride, helping them to prepare for the wedding day. And, and you know, I've never met a bride who wasn't desiring to have a room that's filled with every single person on the planet. Typically, the bride is ready to invite every single person they've ever met in their entire life, plus one. <laughs> and the reason why is because they're excited that they're getting married to their groom. So let me ask you this. If Jesus is the groom in this scenario and you're the bride, are you embarrassed to tell people about your groom? Are you embarrassed to preach the gospel message? Because if so, then what you're saying is, yeah, I'm a bride, but I'm I'm too ashamed to tell people about the groom. If that's your heart, you have to ask yourself, am I really part of the bride? Because I've never met a bride ashamed to tell people about her groom. I encourage you, if you are the bride of Christ, be excited to tell people to come. Come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Come meet the groom because he's incredible. Now I realize that the unbelievers around us aren't going to be readily accepting of this invitation. They're going to do everything they can to ignore the spiritual emergency alert of the Lord. They don't want to hear it. And yet, should that determine whether we obey Jesus or not? Well, they don't want to hear it. Oh, okay. So that gives us justification for disobeying the great commission of Jesus Christ. Because they don't want to hear it, we can disobey Jesus. I don't think that's how it works. Regardless of whether they want to hear it or not, we've been called to go and call unbelievers to join us at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so let's do that. Let's, by the power of the Holy Spirit and for the glory of Jesus Christ, let's continue preaching the gospel of grace so that those who hear and those who thirst and those who desire can receive by faith the living water, which will become in us a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life.